Welcome back to Reliving the War. It's the 25th of March 1996, one week before WrestleMania 12 and one night after WCW Uncensored 96. WWF Raw is still showing taped matches from San Antonio, Texas, but you can expect a ton of WrestleMania hype on this week's show. WCW Nitro is live from Huntsville, Alabama, so let's take a look at the WCW Uncensored results before we get started this week. The second ever uncensored pay-per-view took place in Tupelo, Mississippi on the 24th of March 96 in front of around 9,000 fans. Eddie Guerrero vs Conan kicked things off, a good quick paced match that saw Conan successfully retain the US title. The Belfast Bruiser, better known as Fit Finley, then defeated Lord Steven Regal via disqualification. A stiff, hard hitting match where both men beat the tar out of each other, definitely worth a watch. Robert Parker and Medusa wasted everyone's time in their match, the Colonel got the win after Dick Slater showed up to help out. We have to somehow get comfortable with seeing Ed Leslie portraying the booty man for a little while here on Reliving the War. The Dungeon of Doom mole was able to defeat Diamond Dallas Page in an I Quit Wrestling match. If the scruffy looking DDP won the match, he would get the Diamond Doll back along with that $12 million she won, and if Page lost, he would have to quit WCW. Asshole Man got the win after Kimberly showed up to cause a distraction. The match was a complete mess and pretty tough to sit through. Because Page lost, he had to quit WCW, but of course he was back in no time at all. Kimberly and the Booty Man share a kiss after the match. Kimberly would become the Booty Girl and yeah, that's it really. The Booty Man was a replacement for Johnny B. Bad, by the way. Mark Merrill would debut the following week at the WWF's Wrestle Mania 12 show, and the commentary team took great pleasure in burying Mero on the headsets. The Giant vs Loch Ness was a very short match, thankfully. This was a number one contendership match for the WCW title, and the Giant got the win after delivering a leg drop. The audience were silent throughout the bout, and this was Giant Haystack's final match in wrestling also. Booker T teamed up with Sting to defeat the Road Warriors in a Chicago street fight, a Chicago street fight held in Mississippi. Sting and Lex Luger's tag titles were on the line, but because Luger was wrestling in the main event, Booker T teamed up with the Stinger, and if Sting and Booker won, then Harlem Heat would get a tag team title match at a later date. The match dragged on, if I'm honest, at nearly 30 minutes long, but the pre-match promo featuring Booker and Sting was great. The charisma both of these guys possessed was off the charts. We then had the Doomsday Cage match. This one's been covered to death on YouTube already, so I don't need to bang on about how comically bad it was. It's pretty much a gauntlet match taking place in a triple stacked cage. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan have to fight their way from the top cage all the way down to the ring, going through two opponents at the very top, four opponents in the middle, and another two in the bottom cage. Hogan and Savage's opponents were, of course, the appropriately named Alliance to End Hulkamania, featuring guys like Kevin Sullivan, Lex Luger, Ric Flair, Z Gangsta, and who could ever forget the inappropriately named Final Solution. Apparently, nobody knew what the rules to this match were until the day of the pay-per-view, which tells you all you really need to know. You can tell the competitors had no idea what to do towards the end of the match. Hogan and Savage also forgot that you had to win via pin fall, the mega powers go to leave the cage but then Savage remembers and he rushes back to pin Ric Flair. If I'm going to give this whole debacle any kind of praise, I'd say that the triple cage itself looked pretty cool and at least WCW tried something different, but they dropped the ball with the execution here. Nobody knew what was going on during the last 10 minutes of the match. Nothing more to say, it's a bad main event to end a bad show. 
Eric Bischoff lets us know that the US Tag Team and World Championships will all get defended on this episode of Nitro, Ric Flair is defending the world title against the Giant, and Mongo thinks that this match will drive a wedge through the alliance to end Hulkamania. Over on Raw, the show kicks off with a Shawn Michaels entrance, so let's look at our first matches. Shawn Michaels vs Leaf Cassidy on Raw, and Randy Savage vs The Belfast Bruiser on Nitro. Shawn Michaels comes to the ring with the click cam and Shawn isn't a great cameraman by any means. I like this little moment here where Cassidy waved to the fans at home. So we have one of the original rockers taking on one of the new rockers. We've already seen Al Snow portraying Avatar and Shinobi on Raw, so you can only imagine how he was feeling about this whole Leaf Cassidy nonsense. Shawn grabs the microphone and he introduces the audience to Jose Lothario. Jose comes to the ring and he tells the San Antonio fans to buy WrestleMania 12 in order to see Shawn Michaels winning the belt. As the match gets underway, Bret Hart makes an appearance. Bret goes to the commentary desk. Jerry Lawler says he's having some issues with his car battery, so he needs to go and fix it. The hitman replaces the king on commentary. Bret says that he came down to the ring to get a better look at his WrestleMania 12 opponent as HBK and Leaf Cassidy begin a fast paced sequence in the ring. After leapfrogs and drop downs, Sean gets the better of Cassidy with an arm drag followed by an arm bar. Vince McMahon asks Brett how he plans to counter Sean's speed in the Ironman match and Brett says he'll pound Sean into the ground so much that the mere thought of running away will hurt the heartbreak kid. Brett does admit that Sean is faster than him as HBK hits a crossbody inside the ring. Sean goes for the armbar once again as Vince McMahon tells us we will see it all in the Ironman match including pinfalls, submissions, countouts and disqualifications. What a liar. We see Jose Lothario and Bret Hart once again takes a jab at Mexican wrestlers, saying that the lucha style is very flashy but it isn't punishing and it isn't tough. Leaf Cassidy hits a sit down slam and Sean's head gets rocked on the mat. Before we go to commercial break, Marty Jannetty makes his way to the ring. Bret has a little giggle about all these people coming out for a Shawn Michaels match. Cassidy is in control when we come back, Sean takes a suplex in the ring and Bret says that HBK won't be able to make these kind of mistakes at WrestleMania. Sean has now been busted open, Vince reminds Bret that Sean got beat up in Syracuse and Bret says Sean was beaten up by nine cheerleaders. When Vince tells Bret it was actually nine thugs, Bret says that there isn't even nine men in Syracuse who could hurt the hitman. Bret's troll levels are off the charts here and I absolutely love it. Sean fights back and we see the Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko roll up sequence before Leaf pokes Sean in the eye. Cassidy then goes for a powerbomb to stun gun sequence but Sean gets his foot caught on the top rope resulting in a bad looking botch and also resulting in Leaf Cassidy probably getting destroyed backstage by Sean and his buddies. Sean takes a superplex and Brett likes what he sees. Leaf goes for the same move again but Sean reverses hitting a top rope clothesline afterwards. Sean then hits an atomic drop and then Leaf thinks that Sean is going for a back body drop but Sean was going for another atomic drop. This causes Sean to fall over after the move and you can see the anger in Sean's face afterwards. Mistakes like this don't look good just before Wrestlemania. Marty Jannetty gets involved and this forces Brett to get up and do something. Brett pushes Marty away, Sean hits the super kick in the ring and Sean wins the match. Sean goes to the outside and he and Brett have words with each other. Brett goes back to the commentary desk and even though Sean showed a lack of gratitude here, Brett says that Sean is still his friend. Brett then says that, friends or not, Sean is in for the biggest beating of his life at WrestleMania and our segment comes to an end. The stuff with Brett was good but the action in the ring was sloppy on a few occasions. There was a real lack of communication between Michaels and Cassidy. Randy Savage vs Fit Finley sounds like an interesting match on paper so let's see what happens. Neither man gets the upper hand after the initial lockup. Finley is eventually able to get Savage to the mat with a headlock takedown and afterwards Finley applies a sleeper. Quite strange seeing a sleeper attempt so early in the match. Savage tries to fight his way out but the Belfast Bruiser keeps the sleeper applied in the corner. The referee eventually breaks the hold up but Finley stays in control with a few big European uppercuts. Savage 
Savage finally fights back and Finley begins begging for mercy. Savage slams Finley to the mat and a clothesline follows. The match then finds its way to the outside of the ring. Savage can't maintain the advantage. Finley destroys the Macho Man on the outside, from dropping Savage on the guardrails to using the ring posts to his advantage. Savage even gets launched into the crowd. Finley hits a short arm clothesline back inside the ring but it only gets him a two count. Savage begins fighting back and the match comes to an end when Randy moves out of the corner while Finley was going for a shoulder tackle. The bruiser smashes his shoulder on the ring post and Savage uses this opportunity to hit the elbow drop. The Macho Man wins via pinfall. This was a very simple match and it was also quite a typical Randy Savage WCW bout but I'm still giving the point to Nitro. Shawn Michaels and Leaf Cassidy didn't work very well and a few spots in that Raw opening match were way off the mark. Savage and Finley may have played it safe but at least everything was on point. We have a Ric Flair promo on Nitro next while the WWF presents Aldo Montoya vs Hunter Hearst Helmsley. This match was pretty much used to hype the Ultimate Warrior vs Helmsley WrestleMania match. Aldo Montoya helps Hunter's escort out of the ring and Triple H attacks Montoya from behind. Aldo fights back with a hip toss followed by a body slam but Hunter gets his knees up when Montoya goes for a splash. Hunter then begins laying in the offense, kicks are followed by a chokehold and then we see the Harley race knee. Vince McMahon then plugs Wrestlemania by saying the WWF won't trick fans with a bait and switch like some other wrestling organisations and it won't feature an 8 minute main event with a guy who gets paid 30 million per show. A slight exaggeration there but Vince was definitely throwing the jabs here on Monday Night Raw. As Hunter continues to decimate Montoya, Jerry Lawler says he heard a rumour that the Ultimate Warrior has gained 200 pounds and he now sports a crew cut. We'd have to tune into WrestleMania to find out. Helmsley hits a smooth suplex and we see the knee drop. The audience really couldn't care less as Triple H tries to pin Montoya. Aldo manages to fight back, trying to nail a sunset flip, but it's no good. Hunter goes into the driver's seat once again, but Montoya begins firing back after hitting a top rope crossbody. The audience is completely distracted by something going on in the arena. We can't see what it is, but their attention is not on the match as Montoya hits another top rope crossbody. Montoya then throws Hunter into the ropes, Hunter stops running and we see the pedigree. Triple H wins by pinfall, putting an end to a rather dull match that had nothing going for it. WCW Champion Ric Flair comes out for an interview with Mean Gene Ogerland. Woman is holding the world title while Miss Elizabeth holds on to some of Randy Savage's cash. Ric Flair says he's going to slay the giant in tonight's main event before singing I've got the whole world in my hands. Mean Gene questions Flair about Lex Luger knocking him out during the Doomsday Cage match. We didn't know if this was intentional or not and Flair completely downplays the significance of Lex Luger by saying that the nature boy has been flying so high these past few weeks that he hasn't bothered to even look at the total package. As woman begins playing with Mean Jane and Mean Jane looks absolutely delighted, Flair says that Lex Luger could never be the nature boy. Flair asks Elizabeth and woman who the man is and they both agree that Ric Flair is indeed the man. Flair tells the giant to get ready for the main event and the interview is over. It's a point for Nitro. The Flair promo may have been short and sweet but it was way more entertaining than Helmsley vs Montoya. We have two promos over on Raw, both put together to build up some WrestleMania matches. Goldust will deliver a promo from the Hollywood backlot while The Undertaker has an in-ring interview. Over on Nitro, we have ourselves a match, Mr. JL vs Conan for the United States Championship. Goldust is standing in the backlot and he reveals a mannequin dressed in a hot rod t-shirt. Goldust begins addressing the mannequin as if it were Piper. The bizarre one says that Piper has waited a long time to get his hands on Goldust and at WrestleMania the hot rod will get his opportunity. If this was shot right it could have been really really creepy. The idea of Goldust addressing a mannequin as if it were his opponent does have a lot of potential but they kind of missed the mark here. There's some quick camera cuts as the WWF were trying to give the illusion that the footage was too graphic to show on TV. Goldust says that 
that Piper's darkest dreams will come true when Piper and Goldust become one at WrestleMania. Goldust then says he will have no use for Piper after Mania before smashing the mannequin against the wall. The promo was okay, but we've seen better from Goldust. The Undertaker then makes his way to the ring. Remember, the dead man is going to face Big Daddy Cool Diesel at WrestleMania 12. Paul Bear takes the time to explain the Diesel vs Undertaker rivalry, going all the way back to the 1996 Royal Rumble, right up to Diesel finding himself in the casket last week. Of all the WrestleMania 12 matches, this one here definitely had the most story, and I thought the WWF done a great job in building this one up. The Undertaker asks his Creatures of the Night if they are ready for the feast at WrestleMania. WrestleMania. The dead man says that he would have been content with just beating Diesel at WrestleMania, but because Big Daddy Cool laid his hands on Paul Bearer, the Phenom is now out to destroy his opponent. Taker says that the casket from last week was a glimpse of Diesel's future, Big Daddy Cool's fate is now in the hands of the Reaper, and at WrestleMania, Diesel will rest in peace. It's a by the numbers Taker promo, but that's what makes it good. Can Mr. JL and Conan put on a match that rivals the WWF's WrestleMania hype? Let's find out. We see the absolute weakest lockup in wrestling history to start things off. Jerry Lynn just lets Conan walk him right into the corner and Conan follows up with some chops. JL gets sent to the opposite corner and things heat up after a quick sequence that ends in a head scissors. Conan is able to reply with a sequence that ends with an arm drag followed by a front face lock. Conan then hits another arm drag and JL lands on his feet after a monkey flip. And while all of this is very impressive, these guys are having the same problem that Triple H and Aldo Montoya had. The audience just doesn't care, there's no noise whatsoever. As Conan continues to punish JL, Eric Bishop takes even more focus off the match by telling us that Randy Savage is going ballistic backstage and apparently security had to pull Savage away from Ric Flair. JL reverses Conan's unique modified surfboard into an armbar as the action stays on the mat briefly. Conan and JL trade arm drags before Conan eats a spinning back elbow. Jerry Lynn follows up with a missile dropkick and Conan lands awkwardly on his knee. Fortunately, Conan is okay. Conan hits a gut wrench powerbomb afterwards but it only gets him a two count. The two competitors trade pin attempts and some of this is quite scrappy. JL hits an avalanche DDT and even though Conan's foot is outside the ropes, Nick Patrick counts anyway. Even the commentators pick up on this mistake. Eventually Conan wins with an Alabama slam pinning combination. There were a lot of small issues with this match right from the initial lockup. I enjoyed watching the Wrestlemania promos more I'm afraid. Michael Hayes is singing Bad Street USA before Raw moves on to its next segment. We have more Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels training videos while WCW gives us another match, Disco Inferno vs The Booty Man. We know what to expect now from these videos and over the past few weeks I've enjoyed watching these again. This time the stories of Bret and Shawn's Road to WrestleMania gets wrapped up. We see Shawn Michaels leaving Jose's gym as a hype video plays talking about Shawn's path to the championship. The promo here is very well done. It puts more focus on what happens if Sean loses and what happens if Brett loses. The voiceover guy asks questions about how Sean will cope if the boy who dreamed doesn't get realised, and we are also asked if we still cheer for Brett Hart if he's unable to defeat Sean Michaels. Where is Brett's place in the WWF if he's not the number one good guy? We get more words from Brett Hart. It's taken from the same interview we have seen over these past few weeks, but Brett has always had interesting things to say here. Brett says that he sees himself in Sean. Brett says he remembers passing Randy Savage in terms of his place in the World Wrestling Federation and now Sean is trying to pass Brett. Interesting that Brett would use Savage as an example here and not Hulk Hogan. Brett says that the Iron Man match is all about who gets the first fall and once Brett secures that first important pin he'll just keep piling the pressure onto the heartbreak kid and Sean won't know what to do in order to come back. Brett finishes the promo by saying that WrestleMania 12's main event is all about who is the best wrestler. 
The Disco Inferno takes on the Booty Man. It's quite jarring going from the seriousness of Brett vs Sean to the silliness of the Booty Man and Disco Inferno. Disco says that the Booty Man is ripping Disco off because the Inferno was embarking on the Shake Your Booty Tour. And yeah, you know where this is going. Ed Leslie is pretty much handed a match here where he can act like an absolute maggot and poor Disco is booked as the sacrificial lamb. The Booty Girl, now renamed the Booty Babe, comes down to the ring. She kisses her hand and and slaps Leslie's ass. The booty man runs into the centre of the ring and he starts rubbing his rear end as Eric Bischoff tries to tell us that the booty man has been getting great reactions these past few weeks on WCW programming. Mr Bischoff must have forgotten that we all have eyes and ears. The booty man wins with a running knee. It's over in around two minutes and that's two minutes of my life that I'll never get back. Point for Raw, I like Disco Inferno more than others and I wanted to give this one a chance there was an opportunity for some silly humour here that could have worked, but this was Ed Leslie acting up for two minutes and I just couldn't care less at this point. We should have been given an apology for this match. It's been a great WrestleMania 12 build up between Shawn Michaels and Brad Hart though, and while there hasn't been a deep amount of story between Brett and Shawn, the fact that these two were having the first ever 60 minute marathon match at WrestleMania was all the story they needed. It was all about who could outperform the other. It's simple and it's very, very effective. We've got the American Males taking on Sting and Luger for the WCW Tag Titles next on Nitro, while Owen Hart battles Ahmed Johnson on Raw. During Ahmed Johnson's entrance, Vince McMahon again makes sure to tell viewers at home that they won't get ripped off if they purchase WrestleMania. I'm guessing that because Vince was told he couldn't do the Billionaire Ted skits anymore, he was going to get his jabs in on commentary instead. Vince says that the WWF is no over the hill gang either. Quite an interesting bout we've got here then, Johnson has been steamrolling through lesser superstars for the most part, and Owen Hart is easily the most competent wrestler that Ahmed has faced, so I'm interested in seeing if Owen can get a good match out of the Pearl River powerhouse. Owen applies a top wrist lock, but Ahmed just slams the King of Hearts to the mat. Owen gets up to try again, this time applying a headlock, but Ahmed reverses it by simply lifting Owen up and dumping him to the mat. Owen was forced to turn in midair to avoid seriously hurting himself. Ahmed hits a shoulder block as Davy Boy Smith begins making his way to the ring. Ahmed then mocks Owen by making Hart reach up for a test of strength. Johnson gets down on one knee so Owen can reach, but the King of Hearts takes advantage and starts laying the boots into Ahmed. Johnson is able to put Owen on the top rope. Ahmed playfully slaps Owen and this makes Owen jump off the top turnbuckle. Ahmed was supposed to grab Hart and deliver a spine buster, but Johnson falls over. It's a pretty pretty bad looking spot. Johnson then locks in a bear hug as Owen masterfully directs the bulldog to the other side of the ring. Johnson notices Davy Boy moving around and this leads to Owen hitting a spinning wheel kick that knocks his opponent out of the ring. We go to commercial break and Owen is in the driver's seat when we come back. Ahmed quickly turns things around with a spine buster, this time it wasn't botched, and the match ends in a disqualification when Davy Boy Smith interrupts a Pearl River plunge attempt. Ahmed tries to fight back but the man they call Vader shows up. The heels take turns punishing Ahmed until Yokozuna and Jake Roberts run in. The slowest run in in WWF history. Kemp Cornette backs off as Vince and Jerry Lawler quickly run down the Wrestlemania card on commentary. A disappointing final match from the WWF, even Owen Hart couldn't save this one. The American Males get a WCW tag title shot against Lex Luger and The Stinger. During Sting and Luger's entrance, Lex would only high five the fans when Sting was looking. As soon as Sting turned his back, Luger looked pissed off at the fans. I thought this was a really nice touch. Scotty Riggs and Luger start things off. Luger grabs a headlock but Riggs answers with two picture perfect drop kicks. Riggs hits a back body drop and he celebrates with Bagwell afterwards. This fires Luger up and Lex goes on the offense. 
France. Luger takes out both American males, but Bagwell pulls Lax to the outside. Sting then grabs Luger, trying to calm the total package down a bit, while Marcus gets tagged into the match. After Lax talks a ton of smack to Bagwell, Sting gets tagged in. Sting isn't very pleased about Luger mouthing off and tagging himself out. The audience gets seriously pumped up when Bagwell and Sting go through an Irish whip sequence that sees multiple leapfrogs, ending with Bagwell hitting a back body drop. Bagwell tries to body slam Sting, but Buff Daddy can't lift his opponent. Sting hits two body slams on Bagwell, and the audience goes nuts. It's really awesome seeing how much Sting was loved by WCW audiences during this time period. Scotty Riggs comes back into the match, Sting tags in Luger, and Riggs is able to get the better of Luger before Bagwell gets tagged back in. Bagwell too gets the upper hand after delivering a splash to a grounded Luger. Lax then dodges a crossbody attempt, and afterwards Lax begins to viciously attack Bagwell. Sting looks on, and again, the Stinger doesn't seem very happy with how Luger's conducting himself during this match, but Lax continues to destroy Bagwell. Eventually, Sting and Riggs get tagged in. The Stinger is able to deliver a crossbody on Riggs, and Sting scores a pinfall win. Sting celebrates with the American males while Luger celebrates on his own on the outside of the ring. A point for Nitro then, a much better match from WCW that had better in-ring action and better storytelling. The World Wrestling Federation wrapped things up with a special Bret Hart music video. I'd like to think that most of you have already saw this one, but if not, it's available on YouTube. The You Start the Fire Bret Hart music video really encapsulates the excellence of execution of the mid-90s. It's one of those WWF productions that takes me right back to that time frame, and I know some people don't like these kind of things, but I think this is awesome, especially for younger viewers at the time. In comparison to Sean's Tell Me A Lie music video, You Start The Fire is a complete masterpiece in my opinion. The mid 90s pop rock song has lyrics about determination and not running away, while the main video footage shows us Bret Hart outside the ring meeting fans, cutting promos, acting, getting ready for matches, things like that. I was at the height of my Bret Hart fan when this came out and I'll admit that I have a soft spot for this music video. I think most fans who watched wrestling at the time will agree that it's a good video promo and I'm just not sure how new fans would take to it. Give it a go if you've never seen it before and if you're like me and you haven't seen it in a while, check out the video on YouTube for a heavy dose of nostalgia. The WWF and their Road to WrestleMania then by paying tribute to the excellence of execution. We now had to tune into WrestleMania 12 to see if Brett could defend the title in the WrestleMania a main event. The WCW world title is on the line, the giant squares off with the nature boy Ric Flair. I like how WCW are changing it up this week with a heel vs heel match. I like that we have moved away from Hogan and Savage this week, but there's that unshakable feeling that this one is going to end in a DQ finish, like practically every other Nitro one on one main event. I know Raw's final match ended in a DQ, but the WWF don't rely on disqualifications every other week. Miss Elizabeth and Woman begin throwing Randy Savage's money and the crowd and not a single bill reaches the audience. The money falls on the entranceway as fans nearly die trying to reach the one dollar bills. Randy Savage shows up and he has to get held back by other superstars and look there's Eddie Guerrero back on Nitro doing absolutely nothing of importance. Woman slaps Savage as Flair makes his way into the ring. We get a lot of stalling before the bell rings. The Four Horsemen's Ric Flair versus the Dungeon of Doom's Giant. After squaring up to each other the Giant pushes Flair to the mat. Rick takes a timeout on the outside as Bischoff tells us that Savage has been arrested and escorted out of the building. Flair goes for a shoulder block, but he can't move the giant at all. Flair goes for it one more time, but the giant no sells it, leading to Flair taking an overhead slam. It looks like Flair is actually laughing in pain here. Another press slam forces Flair to retreat back up the entranceway, but the giant grabs the nature boy and Flair is brought back into the ring. Flair's signature 
chops have no effect on the giant. The nature boy is begging for mercy, but it's no good. Flair takes a big suplex and Rick's cell job is completely on point. Flair takes the turnbuckle bump. He then goes to the top rope and while Flair is able to jump off the turnbuckle, the giant catches the nature boy in midair, leading to Flair taking a backbreaker. The giant then goes to the top rope. What a sight to see. But Flair moves out of the way and the giant crashes to the mat. And yes, the giant did overshoot his mark here, but it's still impressive. Flair once again tries to chop down the giant and Rick's reactions to the giant's no sell is excellent. The giant goes for a corner splash, but Flair moves out of the way, resulting in the big man tumbling out of the ring. Flair lives up to his dirtiest player in the game moniker by using wire to choke the giant while the referee is distracted by Elizabeth. And when the giant comes back into the ring, Flair hits a low blow to send the giant crashing to the mat. Woman then chokes the giant with the wire, but the giant is still able to throw Flair off the top turnbuckle afterwards. The match comes to an end then with the giant hitting Flair with the choke slam. This results in Arn Anderson hitting the ring with a steel chair. The Taskmaster tries to stop the Enforcer, but the giant gets nailed with the chair. Sullivan then takes the chair away from Anderson, but the giant turns around and the big man thinks it was Sullivan who nailed him. Kevin Sullivan then takes the choke slam, so it looks like there's some problems within the Dungeon of Doom. Double A also takes the choke slam, and the giant leaves the ring as Nitro comes to an end. I'll be honest here, I went into this one thinking I'd choose the Bret Hart music video over the Nitro main event, but this was actually a fun TV match and the DQ finish was at least a little creative. Flair didn't do a whole lot, but he sold everything like an absolute champion, and the giant played up to his strengths from bell to bell. I'm giving the final point the Monday Nitro. Finley and Randy Savage got a surprising point to start things off thanks to a real lack of chemistry between Leif Cassidy and Shawn Michaels. Ric Flair's promo afterwards scored Nitro the second point, but Raw's two WrestleMania promos featuring Goldust and The Undertaker were enough to score Raw the third point. Shawn and Brett's training videos have been really fun to watch and this week was no exception, but Raw couldn't follow up with their Ahmed Johnson vs Owen Hart matchup. Finally, I love the You Start the Fire music video, but Nitro surprised me with their Flair vs Giant main event, highlighting how necessary it is for WCW to change things up every now and then. Nitro wins this week's Reliving the War, meaning our scores are now 11 points to Raw, 12 points to Nitro, and we're still stuck with 3 ties. Nitro won in the television ratings this week, scoring a 3.1 to Raw's 2.8. This was WCW's third ratings victory in a row. We'll have the Raw after WrestleMania next week along with the WrestleMania 12 results. The WWF tries to go in a new direction from next week onwards as the Monday Night War begins heating up. Ric Flair puts his title on the line once again next week when he takes on Lex Luger and also we have The Giant vs The Stinger. I hope you join me next week and thank you very much for watching.